Today, we will discuss the future of Poland as suggested by the delegates sitting around this table. We shall start with Sławomir Sierkowski's proposal. One, Polish citizenship to all immigrants. Two, reintegration tax to cover the costs of moving 3.3 million Jews to Poland. Three, Hebrew as the second official language in Poland. Four, dismissal notice of the Polish state concerning the concordat with the Vatican State. Each religious institution should act on the same level. Five, minority house instead of Senate in Polish parliament. I think we could even extend that by, by even granting citizenship to people who are of Polish descent who haven't asked for it. So we just mail the passports to people in Israel and in the States and they get them in the mail and then this way they don't even have to go to the embassy. And I think this would, this would really serve the agenda of this movement because I think if they receive this passport they would say, well, I might as well go and see what they want. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to know who, uh, who has to pay the tax. Is it the Polish people? which would be okay for, for me, <laughs> or is it uh, to be shared all over the world, or who is doing this? Yeah, I think it wouldn't be bad to tax the Germans, of course, which is what you're, what you're implying, of course. I think it wouldn't be bad. I think this would also be the first, it would be a precedent, because it would be the first uh, case of one, one country taxing the citizens of another country. I think this would be a marvelous international uh, precedent. I think that's uh, as a kind of an absurd gesture, it would be wonderful. I wonder why Hebrew should be the second language since uh, I think most of, or maybe half, I don't know how many of the Jews with Polish ancestry who are not in Poland speak Hebrew. I'd say there are many more who speak other languages, for example, Spanish, Portuguese. I think that uh, the idea is to revive the Jewry that used to live in uh... Poland uh, back then, and uh, their language was uh, mostly uh, Yiddish and, and Polish in a way, uh, but in, in any way uh, not uh, Hebrew. Well, I would rather suggest a second language in Poland, actually Vietnamese language, because today the, the, our, uh, our minority in Poland is Vietnamese minority, and actually they are inhabiting the former Jewish ghetto part in Warsaw also, so uh, I would see those things also together. According to the official church statistics, we have 96% of Catholics in Poland, I think if I'm not wrong, um, which is um, a powerful weapon in the hands of the Catholic church uh, who says we can't have legal abortion in Poland, for example, because we have 96% uh, of people who by definition are against abortion. The um, regulation that, was in, that is imposed by the Catholic Church is that you have to go to the church in which you were baptized together with two adult witnesses and you have to go there twice because for the first time that you go, the local priest is obliged to preach to you for approximately one hour uh, <laughs> trying to convince you not to step out of the church and only after you reconfirm, yes, I do want to please be excommunicated can you actually um, finish this uh, process and stop being a member of the Catholic Church? I think this is against human rights, and um, I think that we as a movement should campaign um, to allow our members um, religious freedom, actually, in the sense of an easy way out of the institution with which maybe they do not necessarily identify themselves with. we have to forbid the so early baptizing. You can be baptized when you are old, when you are mature. Not, it's cruel to, and crazy to baptize someone who is unconscious. <laughs> I, I, I'm for a multicultural country and multi-religion and to existing all religion together. But for Polish Catholic Church, I would like to... Uh, uh, give some condition to this church uh, and said that you can exist in our, our country together with other religions but in one condition uh, you should uh, 
ordin make, uh, decide for ordination of women for priests, its first condition, and second, accept the homosexual marriages. And then, after this condition, Polish church can exist. <laughs> and that's my demand. Yeah, I think on a very similar issue, I think I, of course, agree with, with, with Kinga's statements about limiting uh, and changing the practices of the Catholic Church. The problem is that one of our postulates is that all religions should be equal. We voted on this today. All religions should be treated the same. This would mean that we wouldn't allow circumcision. Dismissal notice of the Polish state concerning the concordat with the Vatican state. Each religious institution should act on the same level. We have one no and 48 yes. So that will become a part of the agenda. So uh, my proposal is uh, mainly about the problem of uh, inviting also to Poland, not only three millions and a half of Jewish men, but also maybe some Jewish women, because uh, all the time when we say Jews, we mean uh, general, the men. But if you want to invite someone to Poland, you must really also ask the gender question. How will feel in, in today Poland the women which try to live in the Poland? No reasonable woman will like to settle in a country where abortion is forbidden. It's extremely humiliating. But to change all of this, we must change something very ba basic, I say. Uh, we have to change the mentality of Polish men. We should limit men's involving in all kinds of governments. I think it's a kind of make of kind of uh, parity quotes, it, and I think maximum 30 percent for men. It, it's more more than more than enough, uh, and it learn, in this way Polish men find how it will how it looks like living in the place where you don't have power, and it's very useful for them. Is, it, is discrimination a good response to discrimination? Is it the only way to achieve the equality? To discriminate those who are discriminating someone before? Is there any other option? Always someone who discriminates give the same, the, this kind of yes, comments. <laughs> it's a good thing for people who oppress, and oppression can be something you know, very passive. You just take rights. You just take them for granted. It's a good thing for people who have rights for granted to once not to have them, right? A good thing for people who don't get to stand in checkpoints to have to check, stand in checkpoints, etc., etc. We always think maybe of a certain type of Jewish people that we want to invite. And uh, this is just an open question, like, um, what is our desire? Like, whom do we want to have back? Because you know, Mea Sharim's ways of, of putting things in life and the, and the violent um, uh, traditions there, um, it's actually so much connected to what we have already in Poland. And I, I'm just posing this question, do we want to invite everybody? As the American Republicans have found out, the minute they stopped being racist um, and anti-immigrants, they realized that a lot of immigrants and people from minorities are actually on their side in being homophobes, uh, 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 misogynist, and so on and so forth. So in fact, immigrants, especially from, from poor countries, tend to be uh, an ally in the repressive mechanisms of the patriarchy. Um, so this is again the question of whom do we want because it seems like in the imagery that Yael Bartana used in the first film, um, where Sławek Czerakowski uh, 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 gives his speech in, in, in Warsaw at the stadium, the imagery she uses uh, suggests that the Jews that we want back are the liberal urban Jews. We want Franz Kafka, you know, Bruno Schulz. Um, we want Emma Goldman to come to Poland. That's whom, whom Sławek was inviting and hoping that they would all be like this. Um, when 
so, so, so I, I think we've come up, I think the question of, of, of patriarchy is a very, very important question and, and, and one that really uh, forces us to define the scope or the, the, the ideas or the goals of, 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 of this movement. Because why, why, use, why, why, why create a movement that will again create a repressive, another repressive society? Yes, we want to invite also Jewish people who are not so liberal. And we want to be for them liberal. But it, we want to avoid the situation when any kind of religion movement or will dominate the political situation or uh, cultural situation, and uh, also we don't want patriarchate in our country, and that's all. In Iceland, uh, after the, the speculation and the financial crash, actually what was observed in this progressive society is that the banking was too much testosterone driven, and they are, uh, they are considering now the anti-testosterone implementations or rules uh, for banking sector not to be dominated by men. Um, my idea, it's not totally changing the world and Poland forever, but it's a temporary uh, so temporary solution. Uh, because now we have domination of men and domination of Catholic Church, so we have to stop it, to teach this uh, men and this organization to be in equal or even lower position for few, some time uh, to have for them a new experience how to not be in power and uh, but in a lower position. And so my demand is uh, to open Poland for women, Jewish women and other women, also Pol Polish women. Who voted no? <laughs> Who voted no? Stand up! No. <laughs> we have two no and 44 yes, so the proposal is accepted into the agenda. I would like to speak about certain tourism uh, which is going on between Poland and Israel since um, last 20 years quite intensively and I mean Israeli youth delegations to Poland and also uh, Polish religious pilgrimage to Holy Land, to Israel. Uh, what I propose is actually um, through redirection of those tours to question the Polish uh, still um, existing nationalism, anti-Semitism and hostility. Somehow rebrand Poland as Germany did it very well, rebrand itself towards the Jewish perception. So what could be done? I mean, this is just an opening question I, and I hope we can discuss it, how these tours uh, and also pilgrimages in Israel could be redirected. First of all, I think um, what should be included is also that these tours also should go to Germany both to Poland and Germany, I mean to the sites of uh, former uh, concentration camps, but not only in Polish territory. The, the Israeli tours for young people are organized by the state. They're, they're a function of the state and then are, uh, and have a concrete function. Their function is to have young people come to Poland and the very obvious message that they get is if you don't go and fight for Israel, this will happen to you. This is what this, why these trips exist. Create a kind of subversion, that we create all sorts of opportunities for these participants to go and sneak away from their groups during these trips and create, you know, all sorts of parties and in just on the tours, on, 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 the, on the trails of this, these trips, 
these young people coming from Israel to be to, to get this message could have all sorts of um, temptations, w uh, uh, Polish temptations, uh, that would lure them away from this military, and they would want then they would associate with wow, Poland was this incredibly sexy place where there were all these wonderful things, but I had to listen to these terrible uh, to these terrible things that that that, that my but that my military you know that the advisors from the military kept on telling me, but I wanted to go and meet boys or meet girls and do all these things. So I think the, the sexual element here and the element of hormones is incredibly important and is what we can build upon here. I want Poland to be the country which is, you know, ready to welcome the other, but I'm not quite sure do I want Poland to be a touristic attraction. I don't, I don't find those things equal, so that, that is my question. Do you really see, see the link between tourism and welcome the other? Uh, the first visited place out of all cultural institutions is Auschwitz, of course, with one million visitors per year, and the second is the castle of Krakow with 500,000, so 50% less, you know, so, and also we can see in Krakow on the daily basis the leaflets um, saying, stating uh, in one day 99 zlotys, Auschwitz, rafting, and Wieliczka, and the free pickup. Do you think that we should really make it part of the Jewish Renaissance movement to make those, uh, to make those, I don't know, um, uh, those, uh, to make Poland a uh, touristic attraction? It, it is quite important, I guess, also to create a situation that we also are in the dialogue uh, okay. and not only observed through the windows of the bus. Okay. So how would you like to redirect those people, those Catholic Poles who go to Israel to see the sites where Jesus lived and died? What, what is your idea there? I think first they have to uh, understand that they don't only go to the Holy Land but also to the modern uh, country. Tourism is important for the, because it's a tool, just to clarify these, the comments made, um, because it's a tool to achieve the goals of this movement. As a North American Jew, I think that it cannot be underestimated the extent to which these kinds of travel programs influence the Jewish world's perception of Poland, and changing the Jewish world's perception of Poland has to be the first step for any support of a movement like this. If the, our, if the goal, okay, it has to serve our goal, but the, just the relocating Jews, it's also it's, uh, not a goal in itself. It, ha it has broader goals, but if the broader goal is promotion of Polish state, that I'm uh, what I hear here, then I'm sorry, I, can, I cannot buy it, yeah, I'm sorry. So if we are getting rid of one nationalism of Israeli state to create another nationalism, which might be multicultural, multinational, good, it will be even stronger, the country, if it will have not only Poles, but Jews, but it's, if it's all about promotion of this state, then I don't know what we are doing here. As long as uh, we do not abolish the concept of citizenship, we are not doing anything with the nation state. Uh, so we can change numbers, we can change uh, um, the configuration for sure, but it is not true that we are changing the logic of the nation state. Today, universal human rights are guarded and protected by one mechanism only, citizenship. Uh, and as long as uh, that mechanism is, and perhaps we don't have an alternative, it's not to suggest that, but, but that is what nation state is. That is the system that uh, keeps that in place, and that has not been challenged. So in that sense, she is right. There is a suggestion of removal of population from one nation state into another nation state, which will have, you know, a multi... Uh, cultural population and perhaps even will not be called Poland anymore, but something else. It will still be a nation state. Maybe you can do that once again, Joanna, okay. so it can be clear for us yeah. what, what the proposal is. To subvert the route of Israeli youth delegations to Poland and Polish pilgrimage tours to Israel with the help of Poles, Jews and Germans. Yes. Thank you. We have seven no and 43 yes. So Jana Varsha's proposal will become a part of the agenda of the Jewish Renaissance movement in Poland. The state of Poland should devote 15% of its annual budget to culture and the arts. 
15% um, of its annual budget to culture and the arts. This is the state, central state budget. Um, Ooh, let me explain how this should work. The, the, uh, the current situation, for those of you who aren't from, from Poland, is that the state of Poland devotes less than, dedicates less than 1% of its annual budget to culture and the arts, which is, I think, the lowest in the European Union and one of the lowest around the world. It would create a creativity vacuum, meaning that we have more demand for creative people than we have in Poland. This would provoke all the Israelis from Tel Aviv, to go back to our uh, original point, would move to Sopot, which is also by the sea in Poland. And so this is how we would convince them. We'd say, we have a lot of money for the arts. You can come, you can live by the sea in Sopot. So it would really develop Sopot. Um, but also, I mean, they could move to other places as well. You know, everybody could move where they wanted to, of course. The creativity vacuum would draw creative people from everywhere, from around the world. So it's also a, a form, you could say, of creative warfare, because we would create a brain drain from all the other countries. Um, so this is good for the economy, of course. Um, these creative people, and this is, you know, the key. The creative people, the total culture plan would create an ideas bank. So we would have more ideas than any society has ever had. We would have so many ideas, we would be able to solve all problems. Yes? <laughs> Every... Because just imagine, with, I'm, we're talking about millions and millions of whatever currency you can imagine. Everybody will be able to think and, and think of concepts and, and, and solve whatever problems we think about. We'll be able to solve problems that we haven't even thought about today. First, I thought it's really a great idea, but then I envisioned it, and then I thought, like, you want us to, to become this movement, just another Green Party, and now you suggest that uh, Poland just becomes another Berlin Mitte. That is really <laughs> a, a horrible thought. I don't want to live in a place where there are more artists and creative people around than already are here. It would also redress historical wrongs in the sense that the situation of Poland, which is also very different from Mitte, is that the situation of Poland is, as Czesław Miłosz has written, um, that we don't, Poland doesn't have material works of art, not because they weren't never created, but because they were destroyed. Um, and this was done by the very concrete historical force, Nazi Germany. Um, this is the, the loss of culture is, is, is unimaginable. Not all the countries which are represented by us today here need that. Poland needs that. Maybe Sweden and Germany doesn't need that because they already have it. But somehow we have to take into consideration that, for example, for, for some countries, this is a reality or this would be a radical change. That would be a visionary thing. So I would suggest that first, let's have the meter also in Poland and then, you know, let's deal with it. Uh, um, uh, for, for example, uh, I, I come from Greece. If that would happen in Greece right now, I don't know. I mean, you can imagine, that would be a revolution. I thought it was a kind of subversive affirmation of the creativity rhetorics that we usually hear from neoliberal politicians. But the more I listen to you, the more it seems like you're really just affirming and not being subvers subversive as at all. Um, I heard you say several very symptomatic things. One of them was, for an example, it's not about art, it's about creativity. That's the first one. The second one is, we were spending a lot of time explaining to politicians about how good art would be for the economy, and so on. The problem is, just to say it very, very simply, you can't increase arts funding without radically looking at, every, at all the other funding that's going on. You can't go in this direction and think that arts funding will solve something from the top down, that culture will, will do something. I, I just, I really want to say that I really strongly disagree with you and the way you framed your argument, the way you've laid it out. Um, so I'm going to vote against you and I would ask everyone else to vote against you too. Uh, the, pro the, 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 the thing is not for us to get more funding but to bring more meaning to the things we do. What I emphasize, of course, this huge amount of money would go to all sorts of artistic projects. But what I'm emphasizing, and I, I'm, I think I've made this point very clear, I'm emphasizing vast amounts of culturally underprivileged people all around Poland who have no access to culture. This is what I'm emphasizing. So I'm really not saying that organizations such as the Berlin Biennale should get more money. I'm really saying that somebody who lives in a very underprivileged area of Poland should have the access to learning to play uh, an instrument, which then does increase also their chances in the world. It does, and I don't think that's such a bad thing, that it increases their chances of, 
uh, in the world. I want to just say there was a very important precedent to this, which is the WPA's art program in the 1930s as part of the New Deal, um, in which uh, tons and tons of money during the Great Depression in America went to the creation of art works. And this program uh, supported such artists as Tennessee Williams and Jackson Pollock and lists, uh, I could list a hundred more and did create actually great works of art. So that was a response to, to, to a point made before and enabled, in fact, American culture as we know it, which became so dominant in the 50s, 60s, 70s to exist. Something is, is, is a bit of a concern for me here in the sense of what is it that we are believing in, right? What is this, this uh, building narrative that, that uh, is going to, um, you know, uh, liberate us? Because still, again, what I hear behind is, you know, forces of the unadvantaged, uh, the barbaric, etc., cetera, that, um, that will be uplifted. Uh, and so I'm not suggesting that you are saying that, but I need a clarification. Otherwise, I cannot vote for that. Great. Thank you. So now is the opportunity for you, Michal, to summarize um, in the your... The state of Poland should devote 15% of its annual budget to culture and the arts. Okay. And we will, um, concurrent with our new voting methods, we will vote now on Michal's proposal. Twenty-five no and thirty-three yes. So this um, this proposal will be um, accepted into the agenda. The first step for any mass return of Jews to Poland is to remap.